Well, good evening. It's good to see each of you here. This is the concluding service of our Serve Out Mission Conference. We appreciate you being here tonight. It's a great honor for me to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, he is uh, not, a, not a guest, really, because he's a part of our Bellevue family. But it's been an incredible blessing to my life to get to know Dr. Floyd Paris and to be able to travel three times to Uganda. Now, Dr. Paris is a, uh, he's spent a lot of time in this area. He's pastored churches in Kentucky and Tennessee, Mississippi. He has a PhD from Mid-America Seminary, and, uh, but he is the president of a ministry he founded back in 2012 called United Christian Expedition, primarily working in the northern part of Uganda in a district called Moyo with a group of people, very, very unreached people, called the Mahdi people. And so we are so blessed as a church to be partnering with him and to be involved in there. I just came back from there in January. God's doing incredible work there, but he's uh, got incredible work to do. While we were there, there were a half a million of refugees pouring in from South Sudan. And so the ministry there is faced with providing for those and caring for those as well as continuing to work and plant churches among the Mahdi people. And so, you know, it's a great joy to have uh, Brother Floyd with us to be a part of our ministry here, to be a part of Bellevue. And, you know, you've blessed my life, brother. You really have. Now, I, I will have to say I've been to this place in Africa with him that I never want to go back again, all right? There's some long stories i got to tell you, but we don't have time tonight. But Brother Floyd, he's got a lot of his family here. Mom and Dad are here. His brothers here. Would you all stand? Let's give uh, his family and all a real welcome. Brother Floyd, you come on. Yeah, we're glad to have you all. Bless you. Amen. Thank you, Brother. Well, good evening. I'm delighted to be here. Now, I don't know whether tonight I'm going to be more preacher or more comedian or storyteller, probably a little of all of that. But I'm delighted to be here and be a part of uh, the Bellevue Baptist Church. I am probably the worst member of Bellevue Baptist Church, okay, because I'm, I'm not here very often. And when I am here, a lot of times I'm traveling, speaking at other churches, trying to raise money for UCE. But when I'm here, I'm here. Amen? And it's a wonderful church. And I want to tell you a little bit about me. I am a biblical inerrantist, which means I believe the Bible and what it says. And there's been a disconnect with a lot of people who say they believe the Bible, but they find it difficult to live the Bible. And that seems a little odd to me. Doesn't it you? I mean, it seems... A little strange that you can believe something and not do something. Manly Beasley once said, you do what you really believe. Everything else is just God talk. So tonight we're going to talk about missions. We're going to talk about missions. Missions is the heart of God. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, very familiar passage verses 16 through 18. And I'm going to do something strange for some of you. I'm going to ask you to stand with me in the honor of reading from God's holy and sacred word. John 3, 16 and 8 through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that tonight you might take this time, and Lord, you might speak to our hearts in a special way, and Lord, that you might use your word, and Lord, it might do its work in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, open our eyes that we might behold wondrous truths out of your word. In Jesus' precious name, amen. There you have it. Missions. It's the heart of God. 
What is the root cause of missions? Why, why do we do it? Well, you have it right there in the first part of that. For God so loved. Beloved, I want to tell you, I've done a lot of strange things for love. Haven't you? How many of you have children? Yeah? A kid brings a toy and it's broken and there's tears coming down their eyes. And they say, Daddy, Daddy, can you fix this? I had magic tape. It's called electrician's tape. You throw some of that 100-mile-hour tape on that, they thought it was great. My kids think, my dad has magic tape. It can fix anything. Not always. And my wife would say to me, you tape that up? It only costs 29 cents. Why don't you just buy a new one? I said, well, at that time, honey, we had to tape it. We didn't have 29 cents. We weren't at the store. My child was crying. At the heart of missions is God's love. God so loved. If you love someone, won't you do whatever you can to help them? I mean, if you truly love them, how far is too far to go for one of your children? How much work is too much work for one of your children? There's not. All of missions is because God loved. The Bible says God's demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But you also have not only the cause of missions there, but you also have the actions of missions. God gave his only begotten son. Beloved, I only have one son. I have a daughter and I have a son. Philip is my oldest. Philip is not with us tonight because he is a Memphis police officer. He is right now patrolling in Rain's precinct. He went in at 2 o'clock this afternoon. He works on Charlie's shift. And I'm going to tell you right now, I pray for my son. Memphis is not a peaceful city. Amen? You need to pray for our law enforcement personnel. But I'm going to tell you right now, as much as I love the city of Memphis, I don't want to sacrifice my son. But God loved us so much, he gave his one and only son. Beloved, love is huge with God. Amen? That's why he did everything. His loving kindness and the purpose of missions is also found in this passage of Scripture. I know some of you are used to listening notes. Bless your heart. Tonight you get a real missionary. And in Africa, we are event-oriented, not time-oriented. So if my timing seems a little off, I'm waiting for my translator to, to come in. Steve, that may fall on you in a few moments. We have a translator over there. I love him. He's a great guy, but sometimes he stutters. And it takes me three times longer to preach sometimes when he translates for me. Why, why did God do this? It also says that. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, I'm going to tell you, Christians get a bum rap in media. Have you ever noticed that? We're always painted as ignorant and bigoted and, and all that, prejudiced. I am prejudiced. I'll tell you right now. I'm prejudiced because I think there's only two types of people in this world, those who are going to heaven those who aren't. Amen? There you go. Those who are going to heaven, those who aren't. But he says here in verse 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be what? Saved. Beloved, we have a message to tell. That's what missions is all about. It's the heart of God. It's why Jesus Christ came to begin with. 
missions. It's to redeem mankind. Brother Steve shared with you that 2012 we started a mission organization called United Christian Expeditions. Well, let me tell you a little bit about how that came to be. I, I am a two-time graduate from Mid-America Baptist Theological Seminary. Yes, I do have my Ph.D. You ask me how I got it, I don't know. They came and they told me, that's enough, you can go home. I said, okay. And that's what I did. But I was a missions major, and I, I've been to over 40 different countries. And I've seen God do amazing things around the world. I mean... How big is your God, really? How big is your God? We'll get to that in a few minutes. Well, I, I married Penny Canada back in 1982. We had two wonderful children. And in the course of, of, of raising children and and you know, going on mission trips and pastoring. She never got the opportunity to go. The only mission trip she ever got to go, and she would say to me, she said, I'd say, we have missions day at the seminary, honey. Come on, let's go pray about missions. And she said, "Uh uh-uh. I said, why not? If I pray about it, God's going to send us to Africa. I said, honey, I'm getting a Ph.D. If God sends us to Africa, he's probably going to send us to a place where there's a seminary. We had some missionaries in our home one time that uh, we had a missions conference up in Gibson County where I was pastoring at uh, the Mount Pleasant Baptist Church. And so we had some missionaries come and speak at our church. And they came back over the house afterwards. And, and the wife was talking to Penny. And she said, oh, it's wonderful there. You know, we are so involved in the work and the people are so needy that we actually hire somebody to help us. And I have, a, I have a lady who helps cook and clean and take care of the children. And, oh, it's wonderful. And Penny goes, oh, that sounds great. And we were talking on, and Penny goes, you know, may, maybe missions would be okay. And she said, you know, uh, we have, um, uh, over there we have a lot of mosquitoes and their mosquito nets and everything. And, and we were in a, a Obama Shaw, Nigeria. And she said, and we even have a lizard who, you know, takes a shower with me in the morning. He's up on the curtain rod. And Penny goes, what? And she goes, yeah, he's only fallen on my hair one time in the three years we were there. Penny goes, you had me right up to the lizard. I'm going to tell you right now. Well, we had the opportunity to go to Uganda. And she loved it. My wife loved children. She absolutely loved children. And uh, so she came back and, and, and our daughter asked us, she said, please don't both of you be out of the country at the same time. It was scary for her. So we made a deal with my daughter that we wouldn't both be out of the country at the same time until my daughter got older. Well, in 2009, on Mother's Day weekend, I had come to Memphis because my 92-year-old grandmother was passing away. And um, we knew that the funeral was going to be in Nashville. So Penny stayed behind because my son Philip was moving back from college that weekend. My daughter was still in, in high school. So I was here, Philip moved back on Friday, I came on Wednesday, Philip moved back on Friday. On Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, Philip calls me. He said, Dad, Mom's sick. I said, what's wrong with her? Because she's just sick. And I said, well, um, call her best friend. You know, women, I'm sick, I don't know, what do you do? He called me back in about a minute and a half, said, Dad, she's real sick, I'm calling the ambulance. I said, do it. So we were at the nursing home with my father. He was saying goodbye to his mother. We went into the room, and I said, Dad, I hate to do this to you, but Penny is sick. Philip's calling an ambulance, and we need to get back to South Haven so I can get back to Ashland, Kentucky. It's a nine-hour drive. We get back home, and Philip calls me. He says, um, Dad, they're, they're taking her into the heart cath lab. They think it's her heart. Now, my wife had MS, um, I said, okay, I need to get some gas. I'll do that, and I'll let my phone charge. I'll come back, and then I'll get on the road. I went and got gas. I came back, and my son called me. He said, Dad. I said, yeah. He said, Dad. I said, what? He said, Mom didn't make it. I said, what do you mean? He said, Mom died. What do you want me to do? 
I said, take care of your grandmother and your sister till I get there. So at 46 years old, my wife went to be with the Lord. In her memory, we were given some money. So I decided the only place that she had ever gone on a mission trip was to Uganda. So I told the kids, I said, you know, uh, let's go to Uganda. And I will take you everywhere and show you everything. And we'll figure out how to spend this money. Now hang on, I'm going to get you. Okay? I'm telling you now on the front end so you won't think that when I get you that I snuck up on you. Because I'm telling you on the front end I'm going to get you. Okay? So I said, you know, let's, let's, let's do that. So that's what we did. We went all over the place. We went all down the south. We went to Jinja. We went over to Busia. We went down to uh, Ishaka. We went through Kampala. We went down to Tungamo. And one of the guys we worked with, his name is Gabriel Luzira. He said, why don't you ever come up to my people up in the north? I don't know. He said, you come. I said, okay, we'll go. I'd been to Moyo a couple of times when we crossed over into South Sudan. Okay? But we'd never done any work there. So we go there, and he's showing us around. And the first place he shows us is the Moyo Hospital. Let me show you the Moyo Hospital. This is just a health center there in Moyo. But this is the hospital. And I want you to notice there are no food services there. Mother has to stay with a sick child. And that little kid there has a catheter in his arm because they don't have any cannulas. And that little kid, they couldn't hit his veins anymore, so they had to put it in his head. You'll see the wash basin there. And the mothers were begging. And there were children dying about five a week in that hospital. My daughter says to me, Dad, can't we do something? Can we use part of that money and buy medicine? I said, well, yeah, yeah, we can, yeah, we can do something. So that's how it started. We now help supply medicines and medical equipment for the hospital. The hospital Moyo in 2015 saw over 485,000 patients with one doctor. We also help supply 43 health centers that see between 150 and 350 patients a day. No doctor, only a nurse. My son, who was older, said, Dad, if they don't learn how to speak English, to read and write English, they'll never get a chance to get out of the village. Can we, can we start a school? Well, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, sure, that we can do some of that. We found a Baptist pastor by the name of Johnny Bosco Tionde at the only Baptist church I knew of in all the Moyo district, the Laropi. We started a school. This is one of the schools. We now have six Penny Paris schools. This is the school at Laropi. And by the way, they chose their own colors and their Briarcrest colors, which is kind of a God thing because Penny graduated from Briarcrest. That's a school at Dufili, a Muslim village. There we are at a place called Lafori, where we're building a church. And that's also at Lafori. And that's the, the roof going on, the church that Bellevue helped provide bricks for to transport bricks there. The deal is, they make their bricks, we raise the money for cement. If they get their timbers, we raise the money for the metal roof. We now have six Penny Paris schools. You say, why did you name them after your wife? Well, we were sitting around talking about it. We went to a church service there, and, and they got happy and said, praise the Lord. And when, the way you say praise the Lord in Mahdi is a chua a penny. Really? I guess this must be where the Lord wants us. Love. It's the heart of God. That's why we have missions. 
But the question comes, why us? Why are we the ones? Do you know that every single gospel has a great commission in it? Do you know that? Mark 16, 15. Luke 24, 47 through 49. But my, my favorite is John 20, 21. And here's what it says. John 20, 21. You ready? It's very simple. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Let me ask you a question. How many times does God have to say something for it to be true? Just one time. So if you make sure it's in all four Gospels, it's pretty important, right? Now hang on. I'm going to talk about Baptist for a few moments. And I can because I are one. Sorry, Ms. Mashburn. It's bad English, but it's good preaching. Okay? Sometimes we Baptists just don't get it. We just don't. I came back from that trip with my children, and I wanted to apply to the International Mission Board. They told me I was too old to be a career missionary. Okay. Somebody said, well, I guess that means you're not going. Nope. Not what that means at all. It just means I'll find a different way to get there. That's all. Amen? How big is your God? You see, I'm one of those simple-minded people. If God says it, I believe it, that settles it. I had a professor tell me one time, he says, ah, that's wrong. God says it, that settles it, whether you believe it or not. Amen? As the Father sent me, I also send you. Beloved, it is a privilege to be able to serve God. Do you realize that? It's a privilege. It's absolutely a privilege. God loves us so much, He allows us to be a part of it. Turn, if you will, to Matthew 28. Matthew 28. You all know this as the Great Commission. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Why do we go? Well, we go because we've been sent. Now, notice here, it is not a suggestion. I would ask this question, but I'm afraid to. Don't answer out loud. But how many of you got speeding tickets on the way to church tonight? Hopefully none of you did. Why? Well, you get speeding tickets because you don't obey the suggestion on the sign. Is that it? Now, hang on. I'm going to get you. You have more respect and obey a traffic sign more than you do the Word of God. As the Father has sent me, even so send I you. All authority has been given to me unto heaven and earth. How much authority? How much? All authority. How big is your God? We made a trip to Russia in May after the wall came down in December. We went to a place called Zaporosha. And we started preaching on the streets. I was leading the team. We were preaching on the streets, and people were being saved. I could take a gospel track and hold it up and say, Boglubid Voss, and there'd be 500 people show up just to hear God loves them. They've been in communism for 70 years. We went to schools and churches. We got a phone call 
that we need to come to the city administrator's building. And our translator said, this is bad, it's not good. I said, what, what, what do you mean it's not good? No, this is, this is the communist. He is, he is one who says, you have a job, uh, you go to prison, you have a home, you are homeless. This is, this is not good. I said, well, we got to go. Ah, it's not good. We go, we show up. We had two cases of Gideon Bibles. We had 48 Bibles. And they meet us outside, and they go, uh, this former communist building, no religion allowed in building. It's okay. Grab those book, Bibles, fellas. Let's go. So we, we go into the building. They meet us at the front door. Okay. Former communist building. Is no religion allowed in building. It's okay. It's okay. We got it. That's good. We go upstairs to the top floor where the city administrator has 42 staff members. Okay. And they're assembled in a room. So we go in the room, and, and we're at a long conference table, and he's sitting over on this side, and, and the 42 workers are out here, the, his administration team. And he says, he stands up and says, Former communist building, all members here, card-carrying communists, no religion ever allowed in this building. I got two cases of Gideon Bible sitting on this desk. I said, that's Okay. I said, we're not here talking about a religion. We're here talking about a relationship with Jesus Christ. My translator said, net is the same thing. I said, eager, you translate the words that are coming out of my mouth. So he looked straight ahead and he goes, we are not the here. <laughs> the city administrator said, da, this you can do. Okay. My first question was, everybody wants to go to heaven. I think so, don't you? And they all nodded. I said, crack out them Bibles, boys. <laughs> we passed them out. Okay. Amen. So I go through the plan of salvation. I take them down the Roman road. I started to do the American, bow your head and close your eyes and nobody looking around. I didn't do that. The Holy Spirit said, don't do that. So I said, Lenin didn't die for you. Stalin didn't die for you. And the president at that time over there was uh, uh, Kravchuk. I said, Kravchuk didn't die for you. Only Jesus Christ died for you. And if having your sins forgiven is more important to you than being a communist or your job or your family, I want you to stand up right now. 41 out of those 42 stood up. Amen? Then we prayed with them. Then the city administrator stood up. I thought Eager was going to fall over. <laughs> and he said this. He said, I'm, not all of us could make the decision that you're asked for today. But if you could arrange for somebody to come back and teach us the Bible, I'm sure in time we would. I looked at Pavel Menlinko, who had pastored an underground church in Zaporozhye for 20 years. I said, Pavel. He went. <laughs> Amen. We get downstairs, they stop us. Igor says, it's not good, it's not good. <laughs> the city administrator said, you go, he gave us a note, you go to television station and you put on television what you explain to us. So we went to the television station. And I said, uh, okay, how's this going to work? He said, yeah, we're going to record five preachers. We show every day, okay, of, of this uh, plan, what the plan you gave to the city administrator. And he says, put it on uh, uh, with the other uh, men from America. I said, what other man? He goes, oh, he's, he's a preacher. I said, well, you know, wait a minute. I don't, I don't know what preacher, you know. He goes, oh, you know, he tells us to love our wives and love our children. His name is Dr. James Dobson. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. You can. <laughs> Me and James, we're tight, buddy, you know. That's fine. We're walking out, and the guy says to me, he goes, Floyd, how did you arrange this? I said, arrange what? How big is your God? I got on a plane, I had a three by five index card with the name of Alexander Yupolsky. Okay? That's all I had. 
and a phone number. It's a God thing. All authority has been given unto the Lord under heaven and earth. How much authority? If you look closely in the Greek, that's not the command. Go is not the command. It's already assumed you're going because there's absolutely no reason for you not to go. It's as you're going. He just cleared every single obstacle you have to go in. Yeah, but see, we're Baptists. We, we don't do anything like that, really. <laughs> right? I know the Apostle Peter was a Baptist. In John chapter 21, when the Lord says to him, if you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, feed my lambs. And then he says, I'll tell you this. When you were young, you gird yourself and went wherever you wanted to. But when you're old, they will bind you and carry you where you don't want to go. I'm about to prove that he's Baptist. Him turning about and seeing the disciple whom Jesus loved, who also laid on his breast, and said, Lord, who is it that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, said, and Lord, what shall this man do? If I've got to die for you, what about him? Isn't that a Baptist? We got another Baptist in the tree. Right? Moses. I hear this all the time. Brother Floyd, it's great to have that call to missions, you know, like Moses from the burning bush. But God ain't spoke to me out of no burning bush. Really? Really? Because if you look closely at that story, it didn't work out so good for Moses. Moses kept making excuses when God spoke to him. Moses is speaking to God. Moses is speaking to God. And what does he say? The first thing he says, God says, I'm sending you to Pharaoh. His first excuse is, well, who am I? I'm just, what do you mean, who are you? You were trained 40 years in Egypt. To be a ruler. You've been a shepherd for 40 years in the backside of the Midian desert. You know every goat path, water hole, and palm tree all over this peninsula. What do you mean, who are you? Who better to lead than you? Who am I? His second objection. Well, who are you? I am who I am. You tell them I am has sent you. Whatever you need, I am. Now go. Well, you know, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't believe you? Boy, what is that in your hand? Oh, it's a staff. Throw it down. And it became a snake. People said, that's a miracle. It was. There's a second miracle. Pick it up. I'm good. We got, we got 27 different snakes in, in Uganda, and they're all poisonous but one. I just assume they're all poisonous. Amen? Amen. I leave them alone. I don't touch them. God gave him some signs. God said, Moses, I want you to go and I want you to speak these words. He goes, uh, but God, you know, I'm, I'm not a good speaker. I, 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 I stammer and stutter when I get nervous. Moses, who made your mouth? And then the truth comes out. Verse 13 of chapter 4. He said, please, Lord, just send somebody else. Truth is that he won't go. You see, that's kind of our Baptist approach to missions, isn't it? Yes, God, I believe you. I think that's wonderful. Send somebody else. Here am I. Send Aaron. Amen? Amen? Why? See, God tells us what he wants us to do. Go and make disciples. Go and baptize them. Go and teaching them to obey all things that I have commanded you. That's what he said in Matthew 28. To obey. Now, hang on. I told you I was going to get you. I'm about to get you. 
Those of you who are waiting on a call to mission, stop waiting. You've been commanded to go. You don't need a call. You've already been commanded to go. Well, Brother Floyd, you're forgetting about Acts chapter 16. You know, Paul had that Macedonian call. I haven't had one yet. Well, bless your heart. He was already on his second missionary journey. It wasn't a call to be a missionary. It was a call to where? A place. If you're waiting on a call, you've already been commanded. I spent some time in the military, and I, and I appreciate that. I really do. Military men learn because we have it drilled into us. We have a little thing called drill sergeants. And if it looks more important to you, salute it. Okay? You're given a command by somebody hiring you, you do it. You let somebody else figure out the politics of it. Amen? What else does God have to do? What else does God have to do to get you to be a world changer? To get you involved in missions? No, he didn't talk out of a burning bush. No, he didn't give you a dream. He wrote it down for you. Amen? So you can't mess it up. You want a love letter? Here it is, from God. God's doing some amazing things in Uganda. So how, what is he doing? Well, he's opening doors. You want to know where to go? I got one more verse for you. Turn, if you will, to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. I love this. It's splattered all over the place. But there's a key word that oftentimes is left out. It's the key, one, of the key, one of the most important verses and one of the most important words. And we oftentimes leave this word out. But you shall receive what? Power. That's the word dunamis. It's where we get the word dynamite from. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth. Notice it's not or. It's and. Beloved, if, if we're going to be a New Testament church here, we have a command to be witnesses here in Jerusalem, our Jerusalem, and here in our Judea, and also in Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, Steve will tell you he has not seen the end of the earth. He's not been there. He has seen it. We went up to Abaso, and there were 300 people gathered together. And they had live goats waiting for us to butcher. And Steve said, who? I said, us. He said, who us? <laughs> you and me, us. He said, right now? I said, yeah, right now. Did I go to Uganda to butcher goats? No. But I asked them one time, I said, who butchers your goats? And they said, well, the Muslims do that because Muslims kill things. See, Muslims kill a lot of things, but why don't you butcher your own? And they said, because we don't know how. Let me ask you this question. Why aren't you going? Why aren't you going on missions? Do you not understand that God wants the people of the world to know about Jesus Christ? 
Do you not understand that? Now, God may not have given you the direction to go to Uganda. I understand that. But he's already given you the command to go. You got to go somewhere. You got to do something. I have a couple more pictures to show you, and then I'll come back and make one last plea. One of the things we found out is we need to train pastors. Well, you need to preach and win people the Lord Jesus. People who have never heard before. People who need to know about the Lord Jesus Christ. We've started our own association. We have 14 churches. There they are. We have about 30 men and women that we're training. Steve mentioned also that we have some refugees that have come over. Now we have over 700,000 who have come into Moyo. They're looking for food, water. They're Muslims. They're some Christians. They're fleeing warlords and war. How are we getting into the Muslim community? They're inviting us. I'm not knocking on Muslim doors. They're coming to us. How? By showing God's love in a practical way. Dwight Grayson was there putting in some um, playgrounds in Gulu and um, Aganga. And we got wind that there was a cholera outbreak in a place called Obongi, a sub-county of Moyo, in a place called Aliba. Now, that's where the radical Muslims are. So we took up some money. We had some pocket change with us. and Dwight kicked in some money. I kicked in some money. And we were able to buy 225 doses of antibiotic IV fluids. We sent them to Moyo. Five people had died of cholera before we got there. 210 people were treated. No one else died after we got there. The imam comes to see me, and he says, why did you send medicine? I said, well, the God of the Bible tells us we're supposed to love everyone, and you had a need and couldn't meet it, and we were able to figure out what it is you needed, and we sent it to you. He said, but you are Christians. We are Muslims. I said, that's right. He said, we asked the Boko Haram. They could do nothing. We asked the... Muslim Brotherhood, and they did nothing. We asked the Red Cross, and there was no help. We asked the government of Uganda, there was no help. We didn't ask you, and you sent help. That's how? That's why. You also the man who starts schools? Yeah. He said, we have no school in Aliba. I said, no. You understand this is a Christian school, right? Here's what he said. If the God of the Bible teaches you to love like that, then we need to know about more about the God of the Bible. Amen? <laughs> Beloved, that's not me. That's the Lord in all authority. Amen? We went to Oliva, we started a school. He followed me to my, back to my car after the first time. He said, what about Bibles? I said, Bibles? Uh, you mean for the students? He said, no, for some of my men. We want to study the God of the Bible. Can you come and do that? Yeah, we, yeah, we can do that. Third time I went back, I had all the students there, and they came out, and they were singing little songs for me, and everybody in the village was happy. And the imam came, and the imam told the children, he said this, don't worry about morning prayers. And don't worry about noon prayers. What they're teaching you in this Christian school is more important. Really? I mean, a good Muslim has got to pray five times a day toward Mecca, and they just got a free pass on two of them. Last time I was in the village, he goes, You know, Pastor, since you've been coming, we've had several people who have become Christian now, and there's no place in Aliba to worship. Can you build a church? 
let's finish the school first. <laughs> we'll come back and talk about a church. Amen? We've had 700,000 refugees come through. God is raising up a man who will come as a refugee to plant churches among the 700,000 to live as a refugee. I got to give one military story and I close. There was a general, little known general, probably the oldest man to hit Omaha Beach. His name was Norman Dutch Coda, Brigadier General, 51 years old. When planning the Operation Overlord, he had objected because there were too many things that could go wrong. But they said, do it. So he went. He made the beach landing about an hour after the rest of them. The men were pinned down. People were getting killed. In between the mortar fire and the machine gun fire, Coda strode up on the beach. And he asked what was going on, standing amidst the machine gun fire. Confusion was everywhere. Men landed at the wrong places. And he made two statements that kind of have gone down in history. He said, men, we're dying on the beach. Let's go inland and die. He found some rangers, and they pushed a Bangalore torpedo underneath part of the wall. And they blew a breach in the wall. The 5th Ranger Division started through the first man through the hole, got hit by a sniper, and the rest of the squad stopped. Coda said there's only two types of people staying on this beach, the dead and the dying. And he grabbed a weapon and he led that squad through that breach. There was a steep embankment going up. He led the charge up that embankment and took over that machine gun nest. That's how our troops began to get off Omaha Beach. And that's what made the difference in World War II and the D-Day invasion. That one breach. Now, beloved, listen to me. Listen very carefully. There is a lost world out there that Jesus Christ died for. And there's only two types of people who are staying on the beach. The dead and the dying. Who here tonight will obey the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? And go. I don't care where you go. There's a place that is suited for you. And there's something you can do. Don't give God excuses. If you read in that 14th verse. In Exodus chapter 4. After all the excuses that Moses made. It says, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Why? Making excuses rather than obey? Beloved, if God wants you to go on a mission trip, God can work it out. God wants to open doors. God can open doors. Amen? All you and I have to, be do, have to do is be faithful to go. Trust God. Hang on and enjoy the ride. Amen? Can you see God doing miracles? I've seen God do miracles here. I heard a man say one time, I'm never going back to Moyo. He's been back two more times. Amen? Heard a man say, I will never fly into the airport Moyo. He's flown in two more times. Amen? Can God do miracles? Absolutely. What is that in your hand? 
I know there's some little old lady sitting there thinking, I can't do anything for the Lord Jesus. The most requested meal that Americans have when they come over and stay with us in Uganda is chicken and dumplings. The recipe that I taught the girls to make chicken and dumplings, how sad is that? I had a choice. Either had to learn to eat African or teach them to cook American. Do I really need to answer that question? Amen? What's in your hand? What does God want you to do? Better yet, why aren't you doing it? We're going to pray and have an invitation. And I'm going to ask you a specific question. You may not know where yet. You may not know how yet. But tonight, you need to come by and you need to talk to one of these pastors. And you need to tell them, I am willing to go. I'm committing myself to go wherever God wants me to go. And I'll do whatever God wants me to do. Whether it's here in Memphis, Bellevue loves Memphis, or whether it's someplace else. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I want to praise you and thank you for this opportunity to share tonight. Lord, I pray right now. Lord, I pray that you just might speak to our hearts. Father, I pray that you might speak to our hearts in a way that we can understand. And Lord, I pray that tonight there might be several who would stop waiting for a call and start listening to the command and just follow you. Father, I pray that tonight they'll come. Father, I pray that tonight there's some who are struggling. Lord, they may be struggling with their own salvation. Lord, they may be struggling with your love and forgiveness. Father, I pray that they may come tonight. Lord, there may be some who are looking for a church home. Lord, if this is where you want them, this is where we want them. But Father, whatever you'd have us to do, I pray we might do right now in response to your Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts. This is your time, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. And you step out and come right now. God is speaking to your heart. My hope is big.